Okay, look, we've reached 50 people joined, so I think we'll make a start. So welcome to this Making Public Histories webinar on Australia's Broken Years, where I'll be in conversation with Joan Beaumont. I'll introduce Joan in a moment. I'm Al Thompson from Monash History, and very pleased to have you all with us this evening. Uh, let me start by acknowledging that I'm speaking from Wurundjeri lands, uh, and let me pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. And indeed, I just want to note that two of the Victorian history organisations that are pretty heavily involved with this webinar series, the Professional Historians Association and Oral History Australia, have recently issued public statements of support uh, for The Voice, um, I think. Uh, and if you want to see those public statements, by all means, go to the PHA or the OHA websites. So these Making Public History uh, seminars stroke webinars have been going now for about 15 years. It's a, a seminar series offered joint, jointly by Monash University History in collaboration with the History Council of Victoria and the Old Treasury Building. Uh, each event aims to explore issues and approaches in making public histories. They're open to anyone interested in the creation and impact of history in contemporary society. And I'm really pleased that you've all joined us for this evening. Um, just a few practical points. Um, I'm pretty sure you're all pretty familiar with Zoom now, uh, but just in case you've not been in a webinar before, unlike a Zoom meeting, only the presenters and the hosts can be seen and heard on the screen. Joan and I will be in conversation for about 45 minutes and then we'll have about 30 minutes or so for Q&A. So please, if you've got any questions or comments, uh, particularly for Joan, uh, as we're talking, use the Q and A bottom at the bottom of, button at the bottom of your screen. Don't wait till the end. Put them in earlier because that'll help us to sort of plan questions to be raised. Um, if you've got any technical issues, use the chat button at the bottom of your screen, and I've got a couple of colleagues uh, behind the scenes who will be helping out uh, with those. Uh, if any of our internet connections, Joan and myself get slow or are disrupted, then we may continue with voice only, but we've never had to do that. Uh, I need to tell you we're recording this webinar tonight and it'll go up on the History Council of Victoria website, uh, probably available by next week. Um, and just note then in the Q&A, uh, you can, we'll assume that you're happy to be identified, but if you don't want to be identified, just make that clear when you post your question, please. And of course, please keep your questions polite and respectful. And I could just so I'm going to introduce Joan in a moment, but also just to let you know, and I'll stop this share, uh, the behind the scenes, uh, we've got Margie Anderson from Old Treasury Building, who's going to join us to host the Q&A, uh, and also Alicia Serretto from the History Council of Victoria, and Rowan Hart from Monash History, who are sort of keeping an eye on the Q&A and, and the Zoom and everything behind the scenes. So, um, this is a, 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 an in-conversation event where I'll be in conversation with Joan Beaumont about Australia's both broken years and her two books about Australia's First World War and the Depression. And let me introduce Joan, who's a, an internationally recognised historian of Australia in the two world wars, of Australian defence and foreign policy, of the history of prisoners of war and the memory and heritage of war. Broken Nation, Australians and the Great War was published by Alan and Unwin in 2013 and was joint winner in 2014 of the Prime Minister's Literary Award Australian History, uh, also won the New South Wales Premier Prize for Australian History and the Queensland Literary Award for History, and in 2015 the Australian Society of Authors Asher Award. Australia's Great Depression was also published by Alan Unwin in 2022. Joan is Professor Emerita at the Australian National University and previously served as Dean of Arts and Social Sciences at the ANU, and as Dean of Arts at Deakin University. Joan, thanks so much for joining us. My um, pleasure. I've had a lot of fun rereading your two books in recent weeks. And, and so I've set up a few questions, but we can we can go with the flow. But let me start with the book Broken Nation, Australians and the Great War, with a number of questions about that. I suppose the first one, it struck me in several places you note your personal family connection to Australia's Great War. I wonder if you could talk about that connection and reflect on uh, if and how your own family experience have, have influenced your approach to the history of Australians in the war. Well, thanks, Al. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, 
Well, when, I've often been asked in my academic career, which of course has been largely focused on the history of war, whether I come from a military family. Uh, that is in fact not the case. And if anything, I've come to realize over the years and particularly when writing Broken Nation, that I come from a family that if anything is anti-military or at least certainly anti-military uh, service. And uh, I opened Broken Nation with a story that my mother had told me many times about my great uncle Joe, who lost a leg on the first day he went into battle on the Western Front. And he came back to live with her and her mother. And uh, he, uh, she used to have to put him back into bed because he'd have nightmares and, and forget jumping out of his bed to put on his wooden leg. But as I look at, looked at Joe's history, I realised he was a rather reluctant volunteer. He volunteered quite late in the war. And indeed, the same could be said of my maternal grandfather, who sought to serve volunteer only in February 1918. And indeed, as family mythology suggested, he was rejected at that time because of obesity. But then he went on to die of the Spanish influenza. And I often wondered when I was writing Broken Nation and describing the, the terrible divisions within Australian society about conscription, whether my grandmother was taunted when my grandfather died of the Spanish flu. Aha, you see, he finally was got by something because he didn't volunteer earlier in the war. And so, I mean, I guess the fact that my, my predecessors volunteered quite late in the war um, my Joe supposedly after he was given a white feather by his then girlfriend that then fed in into my later experience about the Vietnam War when my parents were both on the streets of the moratoriums in the Vietnam War not so much because of the character of the war itself but because of the issue of conscription and um, when the boyfriends of the family, if I can call it that, I was one of three girls and two of the boys got called up by the birthday ballot when they were both called up. I remember, and I quoted this in the inscription to my book, Broken Nation, my father saying, no government has the right to force anyone to kill. So I don't know how strongly that comes through in the book, but I guess there's a very um, deep part of myself that at first understand, tries to understand why people volunteer to go and fight in a war like World War I, but also, I guess, uh, ultimately is very sympathetic with those who decide not to go. And certainly I don't have any tolerance for those who force others to go to war. Mm. I mean, that that connects really nicely to the a follow-up question, or a question I was going to ask. One of the things I, I really like about the book is that you tr you weave together three interconnected threads of narrative and analysis. On the one hand, the war front, uh, on the other hand, the home front. And then thirdly, the remembering and commemoration. And indeed, every time you write about a particular battle or engagement, you then have a section about the remembering of that battle and how that's changed across time. So I wonder if you could just talk us through that, why you took that approach. Um, yeah, first of all, yeah, what, what was that about? Well, I took that approach because for a long time, I think I've been of the belief that uh, many historians take too narrow and specialised an approach to, to the subject of, of the past. Um, and there's an undue compartmentalisation um, of our, our history. And I don't think you can understand a phenomenon like World War I if you only look at single dimensions of the experience. And so what I tried to do in the book was really um, present the battlefront and the home fronts as being in dialogue with each other. And as you know, I move backwards and forwards between the events on those two major fronts. And I hoped that that would help to throw into relief, particularly developments on the home front. Um, when I came to study again the conscription referenda of 19, or plebiscites of 1916 and 1917, um, I conclude that you cannot understand the passion with which those debates were conducted. And indeed, you can't really understand why the majority of Australians ultimately voted no, unless you appreciate that at the time of these debates, two of the worst battles on the Western Front were being conducted. Uh, that is the Battle of the Somme and the Battle of Third Ypres, or what we more commonly call Passchendaele. And I have argued that 
possibly Billy Hughes, Prime Minister Billy Hughes, might have been able to get public support for conscription if he'd held them at a different time, perhaps even earlier in 1916. But the fact that they're being held, those debates are being held against the backdrop of, backdrop of huge casualty lists, I think explains the passion and, and the emotional violence as well as the physical violence um, that um, erupted on, on the home front in 1916 and 1917. And as for memory, well, the book was written against the backdrop of the preparations for that mega event, the centenary of World War I. And it was impossible not to confront the question of why do we give prominence to particular battles of the past? And when I looked at the centenary preparations, I thought, well, the way in which we were remembering World War I 100 years later was in many respects very different from the way that the people who who lived through that experience of the war remembered it and therefore I wanted to sort of throw into relief how how the perceptions of the importance and significance of particular battles has changed um, over generations. Yeah can I follow up on that one related to that you yeah you talk about you write about how various campaigns or battles get remembered while others are forgotten um, and how that changes across time um, and circumstance but you also contrast the if you like the popular forgetting of events like the general strike of 1917 and highlight that we remember you know Gallipoli and the Somme but the general strike tends to get forgotten and I guess I wonder if you could reflect on what have you learned about the factors and processes that contribute to such selective remembering of Australian history yes well as you know that's a, a huge topic in itself um Look, um, I've concluded that memory, uh, the way we recall the past, both individually and collectively, tells us infinitely more about the present than it does about the past. And that, um, you know, it is, of course, a very selective process. We don't remember everything, but we do give prominence to particular memories. And I think that is because of the values and the I suppose what I'd call the construction of identity that's occurring in the present. Um, but also when thinking about World War I, um, I was very struck, of course, it's impossible to avoid the dominance of the what we call the Anzac legend, that narrative, that lens through which Australia tends to see its military past, but particularly its history of World War I. And although I think I had an argument with my publishers, and I think I was allowed to get the word hegemonic in once, uh, <laughs> but but it seems to me that with the memory of World War One, certain aspects, and particularly uh, Gallipoli, have become what I'd call hegemonic. By which I mean that they have become such dominant ways of seeing the past um, that even those people who might critique that way of interpreting the past, find it very difficult to cut through, get any traction. Um, and uh, so in part, the book was written in an effort to, to bring to the public attention those ways of understanding the war, which don't necessarily accord with the Anzac legend, um, and which might in fact uh, cut across those traditional and dominant interpretations of the past. And I guess the final thing I've I've learned about memory is that it doesn't just happen. You've got to have what, what I'd call in academic terms agency. You've got to have people promoting particular ways of remembering the past. And so I think any, when I tried to trace through each of the battles commemoration, um, I would always be looking for who actually may preserve this memory, um, the who, what, when and why uh, that historians are so um, consciously, I think, trying to capture from the past. Mm. And which begs the question about the general strike in 1917, because when you read that part of the book, it, it's extraordinary. It's a it's huge, huge, massive event. And yet, who remembers the general strike of 1917? So how do you how do you figure that forgetting? Would, was it about not having the agents of memory or, or what? Well, I think it's in part because through very complex processes, which you and others have traced, the, the memory of war has come to be synonymous with national identity, and certain, at least in, in much public uh, debate. Um, and so while we've seen 
the the memory of war and battles be, acquire and Anzac Day acquire a very prominent place in a national commemoration that is public commemoration the events that politicians celebrate uh, we've seen the memory of other aspects of Australia's past diminish or fade and I mean many scholars have commented on this you know the forgetting of Australia's tradition of radical politics um, the forgetting of the huge power and influence that the trade union movement had in the early 20th century um, and as I said earlier if we assume that memory is shaped by the present of course the labor movement is is a much diminished force um, at least in the private sector today, and, and a very small percentage of the workforce are now members of the union. So that is sort of, it, it's just been a memory that has not been preserved and not promoted, or it's it's sort of been marginalised by the other uh, more militarised version of the past when it comes to the memory of World War One. So how do you figure historian, our role as historians then, uh, when we're making histories of events like the First World War or the Depression and seeing things that have been forgotten that are important, yeah, what's the role of historians in relation to the sort of collective memories that are powerful or not? Well, I think, our, I mean, in a quite fundamental sense, I think our role as historians is to try and understand the past to some, to a large degree in terms that the people who experienced it understood it. And you know, I quote a very powerful quotation from a French historian of World War One. He says, it really is a battle for us now to immerse ourselves and to identify with and to empathise with the values of, of many people in World War One." You know, the, the sort of unquestioning imperialism and unquestioning stoicism and acceptance of the narrative presented by governments. But if we don't try and understand the events of the past in, on their own terms, I think we're we're oh, well. We're certainly not performing the role of the historian as I as I see it. Mm. So I think my my endeavour has always been, without endorsing those values, to to present them in the terms that the people of the day would have understood them, and to bring to the attention of today's readers episodes in the past which might not sit comfortably. Uh, with with today's values, but which were were very important um, and essential parts of the narrative and unfolding of events in the past. So, I, as you saw, I tried to you know give the general strike of 1917 the prominence that it had at the day, um, even though it has, um, as we've said, you know slipped out of public memory to a large degree. One of the other examples that struck me is you make a point towards the end of the book, that uh, an Australian government in the 21st century, almost unimaginable that it could deal with the, the uh, sort of losses that were happening in World War I, uh, that they would, you know, the response at a popular and political level would be very different, I guess, uh, to 1916 and 1917. And that's quite a striking comparison. Well, I opened the book by saying no modern democracy could fight World War I. I don't think you would ever find the tolerance, at least in Western democracies, for the scale of casualties. I mean, the figure generally given um, for the dead of Australian dead in World War I is 62,000, and the population is five times that today. So we'd be looking at a death, a death toll of well over a quarter of a million. And I, I'm pretty confident that no, no Australian government could maintain the public will to fight that kind of battle, uh, that kind of war. So, I mean, the, one of the fundamental questions about World War I, indeed about any war, is not just why it starts, but why it continues. And and how did even a government that was very controversial, like the government of Billy Hughes, maintain at least enough collective will to continue that battle, to continue that struggle right through four years uh, in what, the face of enormous casualties? What's your short answer to that? Why do you? How do you explain that? How do we explain that? Oh, um, well, I think. To be frank, we're seeing a similar similar kind of continuation of war in in Ukraine. One once people are involved in a in a bitter bitter war, um, and the casualty levels mount, then you have a kind of self fulfilling logic. I mean, you how can you get out? Um, in retrospect, you'd say, well, probably the time to end World War One would have been December nineteen fourteen, but nobody had won anything, and they'd all suffered. A, you know, very high levels of 
um, death and injury, even at that stage of the war. And so governments sort of find it very hard to sell to the public. Well, that terrible loss really didn't have any value. And so you get caught in this vicious cycle of, of the, a war being perpetuated in the search, of, in this case, over years for something that makes the loss seem worthwhile. Um, just a couple of other questions about the, the Great War book. Um, the title Broken Nation captures one of the main themes of the book, that if Australia starts mostly unified in support for the war, by 1919, this is a nation broken or divided. Um, I wonder if you could just reflect on what you see as the main causes and fault lines. Um, but I suppose also it's it's striking that that's not how we remember Australia's First World War as a, as a broken or divided nation, I don't think. Yeah. Yes, but um, of course, some of the earlier histories of, of World War One did invoke this notion, of, for example, Marilyn Lake. So it's something that's got a bit lost in, in what I think has been a somewhat sentimentalised and sanitised uh, commemoration of World War I during the centenary. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a complex issue because while clearly there were profound divisions within Australian society, particularly around the issue of conscription, uh, as we know, the ALP split very bitterly for the first time in the 20th century. And all of this was, of course, anchored in a, in a, a hostility and division between Protestants and Catholics, uh, which, which was almost was, was toxic. But while you see these very, very uh, profound divisions within what we might call the body politic, we have to bear in mind that um, Australians did not, to a large degree, turn against the war. Um, and one of the complexities of, of the history of World War I was that while Hughes lost the referendum in 1916 or about conscription, he then went on to, to win an election on the platform of let's win the war. So um, one of the things I think is really striking and, and I feel came out in both books was uh, there's an incredibly sophisticated political debate that goes on in both of these national crises. And the quality of the argument uh, during the conscription debates was quite extraordinary. You know, people could talk very passionately about rights and obligations and economic costs and benefits, of course, within the context of the time, which was racism. But nonetheless, they, at the same time, they could could keep their position of opposition to conscription um, quarantined to, to a certain extent from their views about the war. And uh, so, yes, it was a divided nation on, on certain fault lines, but even in 1918, the anti-war movement is comparatively small. I mean, one other question about the war, and this uh, relates to representations of Australian soldiers and soldiering as special. Um, throughout the book, you, you question assertions about what you describe as Australian military exceptionalism, both by commentators at the time, by popular historians and in cultural memory. I wonder if you could talk through that, why, you know, some of your examples of that, of where you question Australian military exceptionalism and why it matters. Well... I think it matters because a lot of what is said about the performance of Australian troops in World War One is just simply nonsense. And, um, you know, there perhaps one of the outstanding examples is the belief, which I found still promulgated 100 years later, that it was the Australian Imperial Force that won the war on the Western Front. Um, now, let me preface this all by saying, I mean, there is no doubt that by 1918, Australian soldiers were were, were pretty good fighters. Um, they knew to be frank how to kill and boasted about how they could kill and they were a quite remarkable uh, fighting force. But what we have to always bear in mind is that they were only one element and a relatively small element in a vast um, alliance of armies. And uh, much of the uh, credit that is given to Australian forces from 1917 to 18 on needs also to be given to other elements in that alliance. Um, I don't think many people would know that um, General Monash, for example, 
went to observe the Canadian performance at Vimy Ridge in 1917, and that the leader of the Canadian Army, Curry, was in many ways just as skilled and just as competent as any Australian commander. And I think most military historians would agree that after the catastrophes, and they were terrible, terrible catastrophes of 1914, 15 and 16, there was something that's generally called a learning curve in the, in the British Army. And what gives an, a general like Monash and, and his troops the capacity to achieve what they do later in the war is a whole range of developments, not just in in understanding tactics better, but also in developing better weapons, more accurate artillery. And it's very interesting how little people were, are willing to talk about the the uh, the importance of the development of artillery and air power in the Australian success. So our ANZAC narrative is is a narrative really about the infantry, about the soldier. But in the end, that soldier could only achieve what he did in the latter parts of the war because he was supported by very sophisticated weaponry. And there's virtually no battle in 1917 and 1918 that is won or to any degree, succeeds to any degree without very high levels of artillery support. So I, I think that's really my position that, yes, Australian soldiers fought very well, but... Um, in many cases, they made the same mistakes as other armies did. And uh, I mean, one of the, the great myths of the of the war is that Australian commanders stood up more readily to British commanders than, uh, for the, the, uh, other, other commanders, uh, commanders of other nationalities. And that's simply not the case. Um, some of the great disasters of, of World War I for Australian troops were overseen by Australian commanders. It's a really good point. Okay, let's let's turn now to your book, Australia's Great Depression, and perhaps make one connection back to the Great War. Um, there's a powerful popular memory of, of shattered Anzacs after World War I, not being well treated by the country that had, they'd served in the interwar years. And yet there's a counter argument that war veterans and war widows and their dependents benefited during the Depression from a repat welfare system that wasn't really available to the families of other Australians, other unemployed Australians. I'd be interested in your reflections on that mm. that question. It's what I just preface this by saying, I mean, why I'm so happy we're talking about both books tonight is you asked me about um, why I take the approach I did, and I said I, I was not in favour of compartmentalisation. I think you have to see these two crises, World War I and the Great Depression, as very closely linked, and indeed, believe it or not I'm sort of thinking I'm in the process of writing about World War II and I mean one of one of the arguments that European historians make is that 1914 to 1945 is really one long war and it's a very interesting idea so what we find is of course that the trauma of, of World War I just bleeds into the 1920s and I think into the Great Depression as well and one of the issues that I confronted you know is can can to what degree do we attribute the suicide levels of 1930, which happened to be the highest level of male suicide in Australia in the 20th century? You know, how much is that a phenomenon of war? How much is it a phenomenon of depression, great, the Great Depression? And I don't think you can really separate the two. But back to repatriation, yes. I mean, it's the work of some of my colleagues, particularly Martin Quatty and Mark Adele, have shown. Um, Australia's repatriation system was one of the most generous of the belligerence of World War I. That said, it could never, of course, meet the scale of need. And there were some uh, often very difficult negotiations between individual soldiers and the repatriation officials about their level of disability, what their level of entitlement was for pensions. And uh, we know now, of course, that the treatment of mental illnesses arising from World War I was very limited and, and very inadequate. But as you've hinted, what I found really very interesting was that in the Great Depression, um, the memory of the or the appreciation of the soldier service was so high that um, two decisions that the government of James Scullin, a Labour government, came to power, unfortunately, three days before the stock market crash of, of, of 1929, 
two decisions they considered making. One was to remove from the veterans their preference for employment in, in, in the public sector. And the second, in 1931, when they were considering cutting everybody's pensions by 20% as a, an, aus an austerity measure to try and, and prop up Australian government finances. In both cases, uh, Scullin found he simply could not um, speak against um, the very prevailing notion, the soldiers had already made their sacrifice. Now this, you know, the language at the time was that we have a debt, a national debt to these men who gave their lives or suffered terrible injury voluntarily in World War I, and it's not appropriate to ask them to make another sacrifice. So in 1931, when pensions almost across the board were cut, um, those pensions that um, were paid to the widows of the war dead and to some seriously injured soldiers who remained um, preserved. So the respect and um, reverence for the soldier is, is, I think, quite profound throughout the Great Depression, of course, later years. Yes. Just turning more to the Depression itself, you write, I think, really powerfully in the book about what you could describe as the unequal demography of the depression and the differential impacts of unemployment. And I think that's an aspect of Australia's depression that possibly tends to get forgotten. I wonder if you could talk through that argument and the types of inequalities and differences that you highlight in the book. Yes, well, I, I think we all know that the notions like Australia and Australians are, are constructs, and yet we just slip into them so readily. And yet when you look at, at, at this nation in 1929 or indeed before that, it's it's a very diverse collection of communities and what I call micro-economies. And I included in the book some some maps of Australia, which which I found very interesting, simply to look at where, for example, the distribution of sheep production um, was across the continent. Where was wheat grown? Where were cattle tended? Because um, two of the industries to be most severely affected by the Great Depression were wheat and wool, which suffered collapse, complete collapse in commodity you know, export prices. And so I think you have to bear in mind that there are many, many different uh, sectors of the co economy. So apart from wheat and wool, uh, another that was very severely um, affected by the economy was the manufacturing industry, which just crashed uh, for, for a few years, but did actually start to recover quite early as well. So um, you have, as I suppose you do in most crises, winners and losers. And I think a lot of the literature of, of the Great Depression has focused on the losers more than the winners. Um, but I believe that no matter what um, issue we look at in the past, we have to resurrect that now much forgotten and neglected concept of class. And um, I have two pic pictures side by side in my book of, of uh, working class children without their shoes looking extremely uh, dishevelled, and a child sitting in, Ad in an Adelaide garden who looks to, you know, as if life could not be more prosperous. So what sector of the economy you're in made a lot of difference um, to the impact of the Great Depression upon you. And I suppose, as is often the case, the people who are already vulnerable and already exposed to economic and social pressures tended to be the ones that carried the greatest uh, burden. There was a lot of discussion in the policy circles and in, in the public about the need for equality of sacrifice, which is a very, was the same issue as had dominated the conscription debates. But I think the reason that equality of sacrifice, the idea that everybody had to carry the, the share of the suffering of the Great Depression was such a powerful mantra because in fact, it wasn't the case. Um, you know, the, the, the burden was not being carried or the impact of the depression was very uneven across different sectors of Australian society. And you make the very good point that uh, uh, for middle-class professionals who tended to be much more likely to keep their jobs than skilled and unskilled manual workers, uh, because prices fell more than fell more than wages, actually they were better off. If you kept oh, your job, you could be better off. 
Yes, and anybody who had any capital, you know, could buy property at very low prices and so on. So, yes, I think we. I'm in one section of the book. I look at. I devote entirely to people who were what I call on the margins or at risk, and clearly, I mean, there were some groups. I think single people, single men, particularly casual employees. Um, those who were not highly unionized. Those who fell outside any particular strong community. That, they were exceptionally vulnerable. And I guess that's one of the reasons why one of the more popular images of the Great Depression is the swagman, you know, the man wandering around the countryside begging for food at the door of a farmhouse uh, or the, the the guys in the streets, you know, with very small commodity like cotton reel or pencils trying to get some money. That's why it's such a powerful image is because they are, in fact, the the people who are most exposed um, to to uh, economic disaster. One of the other features of your the Great Australia's Great Depression book is you really highlight the experience of Aboriginal Australians during the Depression. Um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about the distinctive impacts of well, particularly the Depression, but maybe also the war, but the Depression upon Indigenous Australians. Yes, well, again, there were variations across Australia, but. Of course, or again, um, most Aboriginal people were already in a position of, of, of deep social disadvantage even before the Great Depression. Um, hit met, many of them were under protection regimes, as they were called, subject to many con restrictions and regulations by governments, um, state governments were responsible for this at that time. Um, and apart from, you know, their, their deeply entrenched um, economic and social uh, disadvantage, many of them were casual labourers, the kinds of people I've already mentioned, who were laid off very quickly as the economy contracted. In my um, chapter on Aboriginal Australians, I, I spent quite a little time looking at the situation in Western Australia, in part because we have very good records, and that's one of the things that, of course, limits the historical inquiry, but there was a Royal Commission into the condition of Aboriginal Australians in the mid-1930s. And as I say, it, the, what it reveals is a story without redemption. I mean, it was truly terrible. Um, the protector, uh, the quite famous Moore, uh, thought the only way to deal with Abor Aboriginal disadvantage during the Great Depression was to round them up and force them to go to a particularly a notorious reserve called Moore River, uh, where conditions were, were really quite, quite dreadful. Um, I also uh, found in that, in looking at the condition of Aboriginal people, that alas, you know, many white communities, as is the way themselves under economic pressure, um, took exception to the kinds of shanty towns that would build up around their, their town in in Western Australia and elsewhere. I mean, that was a phenomenon across the country. It's not just the Aboriginal Australians that were were seen as, as um, lowering property prices, posing a threat to the health and welfare of white communities. Um, foreign communities like the Italians in Queensland were also um, the object of suspicion um, and resentment. So I think, you know, the story of Aboriginal Australians is generally a really depressing one during the Great Depression, with some exceptions. And I also consider in that chapter the, the stimulus that the interwar years gave to the growth of Aboriginal activism itself. You know, this is when you start to see um, the emergence of, of some of those associations that would then champion Aboriginal civil liberties and their claims to better social and economic rights. Mm. In the book, you you explain the importance of charitable efforts and voluntary support for the unemployed, but, and you also talk about the limits of, of state support for the unemployed and the belated and sometimes begrudging government support for the unemployed through sustenance or work for, for Dole. But you do argue that, that in combination, that just about prevented the worst effects of unemployment. You don't get mass starvation in Australia in the 1930s. And you highlight the significance of resilience. What did you learn about resilience and its significance from the research? Well, I, I learned that it's, uh, that of course, it's very difficult to actually pinpoint or to identify um, the sources of resilience. Um, 
I don't really want to duck the question, but but you can't come up with a kind of checklist and say this is what makes people resilient if they have strong family support or or a good childhood or good education. Nonetheless, I, I concluded that um, as a whole Australian society proved quite, I think, quite remarkably resilient, particularly because these events are occurring a little more than a decade after World War I. And I almost wrote a revisionist account of myself, you know, perhaps in Australia wasn't as broken as I thought it was. Um, but it's because I think that resilience manifested itself at all levels, what I would call the government level, the community level, the family level, and the individual level. And what is striking, I think, in both books, as I've already alluded to, is the capacity of the Australian political system to accommodate, I think, a lot of crisis, a lot of protest. Um, I mean, in both those crises, the political parties reconfigured themselves in the face of, of new challenges from new parties like the paramilitary organisations, the citizen movements. And so there's some quite adroit reconfiguration of politics in both crises. There were elections in both crises. I think Australians found they had the capacity, at least in the case of the Great Depression, to reject their governments. It was hardly a government that survived the Great Depression if it was in power at the beginning. As you say, the governments had comparatively little capacity to offer significant financial or um, support to, to the people or to provide them with employment. But they did probably just enough to, to provide a kind of safety net. And then, as you say, I found the the skills that the community had learnt to raise funds and to generate uh, comfort funds, as they were called, for the the troops in World War One, seemed to be carried on into into the Great Depression. An enormous amount of um, food and other commodities were purchased and distributed, largely, of course, by churches, but other voluntary organisations during the Great Depression. I concluded that family was pretty important, critically important, that those who had a strong extended family network or neighbourhood were could find um, some support during times of economic crisis. But then I was left with a very interesting question, which still continues to, I uh, continue to ponder over, what is it about some people that they find in crisis and trauma, uh, they find the capacity within themselves to somehow endure and to adapt and to improvise. I mean, David Potts's famous book on oral histories of, World, of the Great Depression keeps saying people talked about making do. Uh, people had the, seemed to find somehow, in the majority of cases, the capacity um, to, as I say, improvise and, and uh, innovate and support each other through the crisis. So resilience, if you take it as being the capacity to sort of bounce back and, and to adapt, does seem to have been manifest at various levels in, a, mm. in the Great Depression. Mm. I mean, following on from that, you'll know that in a book review, a review of the Australia's Great Depression, Marilyn Lake argued that she argued that you make too much of resilience and not enough of resistance during the Depression. Mm. What's your response to that? Well, yes. Uh, <laughs> I think there's a lot about resistance in my book. Uh, um, I think Marilyn didn't think I gave due credit to um, radical cheeks, for example, by radical feminists at the time. But there's a lot in the book about the protests against the levels of sustenance and government support. There's about the evictions, about the street fighting that occurred, the violence that, that occurred between not just the unemployed workers movement, the communist front, but between them and the police. I think to some extent, I mean, this is a period of, of right-wing armies and you have to see them as a kind of resistance. So they are a protest. They may not be the protests that, that uh, today we find acceptable, but certainly they were very, very adamant in their, and, and transient in their critique of government. I think what probably Marilyn um, took exception to was I do, in the end, I suppose, reach what might be co called a conservative conclusion, which is, I don't think that either from the left or from the right, there was anything that constituted a radical challenge to Australia's political structures. Um, 
Now, I could debate that more if you wish. But I was using as my yardstick, I suppose, what was going on in Europe. And when you look at what was happening on the streets of Berlin and you look at the, uh, at the way in which the Nazi movement did, of course, uh, not only challenge but ultimately destroy the democratic system of Germany on the basis of what was happening in the Great Depression. And if you look at what's happening in Russia, I mean, nothing, nothing of that um, ilk occurred in Australia. So whatever the protests and the, and, and it, as I say, there was a great deal of protest on many issues. I don't think it came to the point of, of destabilising the, the Australian state. Mm using that in the sense of you know, yeah. the institutions of state and democracy. But a different way of approaching the question, what sort of lessons do you think Australians took from the Great Depression and, and with what effects? Well, of course, I was writing. I call this my COVID book, um, my lockdown <laughs> book. Um, <laughs> I was writing it at the time that we were facing you know, another great crisis. Um, and, I, and it was interesting to reflect on on the almost the century and with what what we had at learnt and how the two crises were different. I mean, it, you can't overstate it, but I think the thing Australia did learn from the Great Depression and which follows through in in later policy making is the need for there to be a much greater social welfare net um, for the disadvantaged. Um, and you see this in in. You know, Curtin and Chifley's post post war um, social welfare agenda, and so in during COVID, I mean, we, for all their limitations, we had Job Seeker, and its counterpart, the name which I forget. Job, what was the other one? Anyway, the the government intervened to ensure that people did not starve, that they could continue to to eat. And also importantly, one striking difference was that there were nobody was thrown out of their homes during the COVID pandemic. One of the great images that mobilized the left and continues to, to stay in people's minds from the Great Depression is people being thrown out in the street with their furniture. Um, through a, a, a series of measures, Australians basically were given something like a rent or a mortgage holiday. And so you don't see the same kinds of levels of eviction. And, and obviously the 1930s were a time when, when not only Australia, but globally, people learned a great deal about how to manage economic crisis. You see John Maynard Keynes's notions uh, gaining a dominance and we now understand in a way that the politicians of 1930 and 31 didn't or couldn't how dysfunctional it is to keep um to reduce people's spending power to the levels where they can't simply buy anything and, and you get this cycle of of depression and retrenchment um now, since then, of course, we've had many different um, economic orthodoxies, but I think everybody understands the need to to ensure that you can you don't kill the economy while you're trying to cure it. Yeah. Well, one last question for me before we open this up. I mean, you, you talked about COVID and it was interesting that during COVID, the newspapers started to reflect upon lessons from the Depression. It became back in, into popular discussion, but my sense is that in recent decades, by comparison with World War One, uh, the Great Depression hasn't been prominent in Australian memory. Your thoughts on that? Oh, I agree entirely. I mean, you you can travel through the city, well, go through any any country town, and of course you'll see memorials of various kinds, often newly renovated to Australia's military history, but you'll look in vain in most cases for memorials um, to the work that was done during the Great Depression. So in my book, I tried to list some of the things that were built during the Great Depression. Um, boulevards, bridges, um, the Shrine of Remembrance, you know, all these things. And yet they're, they're, they're not attributed to the work, the relief work that was conducted by men, largely men, who are unemployed. And, and so you're right, that whole memory of how we recovered from or how we endured economic crisis has really faded and I think not only in Australia but elsewhere 
we tend to talk about the two world wars and we call it the interwar period, you know, the, the, the 20 years in between. And yet the depression is sitting there right in the middle and it's still recognized to be the greatest economic crisis that the global economy has ever experienced. And yet we, we talk so little about it uh, compared to the emphasis that we give to the, the wars that bookended those, those 20 years. Well, let's hope that uh, your book, Australia's Great Depression, will shift, help shift that and bring it back into recognition because there are all sorts of lessons to be learned. Yeah. Well, I, I suspect that it probably won't because um, I do think that a lot of popular memory, if I can end on a somewhat controversial note, uh, arises from our preference for disaster and catastrophe. Um, the bigger the catastrophe, you know, the, the more it seems to, to mesmerise us in terms of popular memory. And whatever the suffering of the Great Depression, and as you said, there's been something of debate about how extensive that was, nothing in the Great Depression matches the horror of the trenches of the Western Front. So mm. perhaps it's the way it's the way we like to remember the past is with an emphasis on catastrophe, Look, not on resilience and recovery. Thank you, Joan. Look, um, let's switch tack now. I noticed there are already quite a number of comments and questions in the Q&A. Uh, so let me bring Margie Anderson from Old Treasury Building in. Margie's going to now chair the Q&A. Um, and over to you, Margie. Thanks, Al. And thanks, Joan. That was just a wonderful discussion. So many questions raised, and we can see the response in the audience already. Um, so we'll start on those questions in just a minute. But just a reminder, there's plenty of time for you to add a question if you want to. Just type it into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can be anonymous if you want to be, it's your choice. So we have some wonderful questions, but given Jones chosen to end on a controversial note and um, linking those eras, why don't we begin with a question from Peter McPhee, who says, great discussion. You point out, Joan, that the whole period, 1914 to 45, is one of war and crisis. Indeed, some European historians talk of the Second Thirty Years' War, mm. harking back to 1618 to 1648. Could you both speculate on how this concept might reshape the way we think of that period in Australian history? Yes, well, thanks, Peter. Um, as I said, there are many in Europe particularly who see this period as one long war, and as you say, it covers, interestingly, covers 30 years I'm not entirely sure yet myself, and as I say, I'm working on World War II, how appropriate that notion is to Australia, because I think one of the things that really underpins the concept of one long war in the case of Europe is Franco-German rivalry, um, which you know, I'm simplifying a huge issue to some degree, Franco-German rivalry was a source of uh, conflict in both world wars. And I think the Second World War for Australia, particularly after the entry of Japan into the war, has in some ways has a very different mix to World War I. And the striking thing about World War II in Australia's case is that although the threat of invasion was, was evident in a way that it was not in World, uh, in World War II in the way it was not in World War I, the number of casualties in World War II is actually lower than World War I. Now, that would, I think, be true also of Britain, but in the case of, of Germany and the Soviet Union, um, the death toll in World War II is just extraordinary compared to even to World War I. So you can, you can almost construct World War II as a more positive um, experience, particularly for Australian industry and the Australian economy. Than was world than the world world war one was so i guess if we're going to see it as a 30 years war we've got to see the same kinds of issues the same kind of impulses uh flowing through um the two conflicts and of course australia did come did enter world war ii as a consequence of imperial lo loyalty to some extent the great driver of its involvement in 1914 appears again with Menzies' famous comment in 1939 that Britain was at war and so Australia was at war. But I think the second part of World War II sees Australia emerge into a different kind of um, 
understanding of, of what the conflict is about. And the impact of the war on Australia is very different um, in 1941 to 45 than it is in earlier years. So if I can just duck this for a moment, I'm not quite sure whether one long war suits Australia, but it's certainly a very interesting concept to, to I think, to analyse. And I'd have to say that I think the post-1945 world is, is a very different world. Uh, for not only um, belligerents in Europe, but also in, in the case of Australia. So I know historians don't like to, we can always argue about periodization, but there's certainly a post-1945 era that's very distinctively different for all sorts of reasons. Well, I'll just oh, you... say, yeah, I, I think I agree with, with Joan. I think the 30-year war makes some sense in a European context and throw in, of course, the Spanish Civil War as well. Uh, which mm. in some ways is a, a proxy war for the different uh, belligerent nations. Um, I think Australia's distance from, and um, you just have a very different set. I mean, yeah, I, I, it doesn't seem to work in, as a concept for the Australian context would be my my thought. Mm. Now we've got we've got a couple of other questions which are ranging widely over time. So perhaps it makes sense to move to those um, before we get some of the more specific ones. Uh, Bernard has said, I think of 1890 to 1939 as a distinct period in Australian history. To what extent can 1935 to 45 be also included? Um, and you might want to answer that, but then there's another one from Jonathan, which is also covering similar period. And he says, many general histories of Australia suggest that Australia's World War II, to some extent, healed the broken years and brought some level of national cohesion. I think one historian calls it a sufficient unity. I don't want you to give away the conclusions of your forthcoming World War II book, but how useful is that as a way of thinking about the period 1914 to 45 as a whole? How much did Australia's World War II help to heal the deep divisions that emerged by the end of World War I? Yes, there's a lot in those two questions. Mm -hmm. um, one thing, and I, I'd, I'd love to hear Al on this too, one thing that I really found very surprising in my work on the Great Depression was that I fully expected the sectarianism that erupted in World War I to shape politics to a greater degree than it did. And, uh, of course, Jim Scullin himself was Catholic, and it's... I think the, the the social welfare programs of the Great Depression um, were delivered along sectarian lines. You know, Catholic churches uh, dealing with Catholic populations and so on, but it doesn't infuse the public debate in the way that it did in World War One. And I think you could probably say the same um, of World War Two, even though, of course, you've got a lot of tensions within the Labour Party between um, the Catholic wing. And and the left, the le the communist elements of the party because of the Spanish Civil War. So this question really is, uh, you know, sorry, the question was really: Is World War Two a more unifying war? Is um, yes, um, the broken years and brought some level of national cohesion. Well, I think I think you'd have to say that we're not the, the same the same level of. Uh, uh, fractures in World War II, although, of course, there was a lot of industrial dis disputation in World War II that, again, we tend not to hear a great deal about. But I think it's, it's, it's very striking that Curtin was able to introduce a form of conscription in 1943. I mean, he didn't ever actually have to use those powers but he managed to persuade the Labour Party that some kind of conscription was necessary um, under pressure from General MacArthur. So I think what you can see in World War II is that the external threat, you know, the manifest external threat and the bombing of, of, of many Australian towns um, did resolve to some degree that question of national defence, uh, which had been left unresolved by the debates of conscription. Um, but I think generally the pressure on Australia in World War II was less than it was in World War I. I'm not quite sure why I say that. I think it's probably because of the casualty levels. 
But again, it depends which section of Australian society you're looking at, because one of the areas that I have studied a lot in my career is is prisoners of war. And I think for the families of prisoners of war, World War II was a terrible, terrible experience. But uh, generally, I think we didn't have the casualty lists of the Somme and, and Passchendaele. Al, do you have a thought on that? I suppose the one thing I'd add is that what's really striking after World War One that those divisions that emerged during World War One and not not so much the sectarian ones, the one between soldiers and shirkers, but particularly between loyalists and disloyalists, which becomes mm -hmm. a really significant divisive uh, feature of the nineteen twenties and thirties uh, Australian politics and society. You don't get that sort of the, those powerful divisions um, coming out of World War Two. Um, no. I, think, I think that's probably the no. most striking difference. Because, as I say, the war shifts and the war changes radically in character in 1941. And, you know, um, but even, you're right, even in, in the early days, there's not that same resort to demonising people on the ground of disloyalty, but such a powerful, powerful weapon used politically in the early years. Is a, a quite different question, um, which is also linking to current debate from Christine. And she says, how did the mainly print media influence the public's support of the war during World War I compared with the power of the media now? The acrimony around the voice being presented in the media being a current example. Well, I, I guess the first point to note is that there was uh, only a print media in World War I, I think what most people are really still struggling to fully understand is what is the impact of social media on political debate, particularly in a contentious issue, such as The Voice has become. Um, I think the print media in World War I was probably pretty influential. Um, one of the people I've often thought about writing about, but I'm getting a bit too old, running out of the years, um, was Henry Boot, who was editor of the, of the Australian Worker. Now, um, you know, he wrote remarkable editorial pieces and the Australian Worker wrote these, um, circulated these cartoons, which of course just became so much part of the political debate. Uh, the blood oath being the most obvious piece of media, you know, just demonizing people um, on the grounds of uh, using the Catholic creed as a way of, of demonizing those who would vote for conscription. Um, it was pro we probably had a public in World War I that read print newspapers more than, certainly more than they would today. Um, but although one can say, well, look, the print media was probably very influential, the, the other problem is we have virtually no, no instruments at that time for measuring public opinion other than um, through casual observation. I mean, we have very, very limited public opinion polls. And uh, even when it came to the way the soldiers voted about conscription, we're still lacking any, any really finely grained analysis of that. So I think, I mean, I would assume that the print media had a, had a quite significant influence in World War One. I, I doubt that the print media is the dominant form of influence today at all. I mean, I thought the mix of social media and television commentary are the things that shape people's um, political, the formation of political views today. Can I, can I just add a, ask a follow-up to you, Joan, about, which is about the comparison in terms of the concentration of media ownership and control in yeah. the war period compared to now, do you get a sense that during World War One there was a greater diversity of of media? I think there was, um, but it is also striking. I mean, if you ever, as I imagine most of us do, use trove, you will often find that many stories were sort of what I suppose we call syndicated. Basically, the same story pops up in all the you know the the Mary Burr chronicle on the Cairns times and whatever but you've yes you've got you do have independent conservative newspapers in each of the major capital cities which of course is contrasted today with the dominance of the Murdoch press across the capital city newspapers is pretty striking um and and what you've got is is I think a very powerful labor press um that's just disappeared um but you've got a lot more newspapers, many, many. But um, again, some of them would have been sourcing their information from central sources and, and recycling it. But um, 
yes, the days of, of diverse print media, I think, are over. Now, we have a question, which is an interesting one about sources. Um, Margaret Bertley says, you mentioned, Joan, that the records for understanding the Depression are uneven across Australia. Are any major records still closed um, that you would have liked to access? And do you think additional sources of evidence about the period will emerge? Um, thank you, Margaret. Um, look, I think what struck me was that and I did have a team of people working in different capital cities is that the richness of the sources that come from local councils varies the surviving records varies enormously um I'll be interested if somebody can find them for me but I have looked and looked and can find very few Sydney council records and I spoke to one local historian there, very eminent local historian, he said he thinks they probably were trashed when a lot of uh, councils merged some decades ago. Whereas the Melbourne local council records are extraordinarily good. And what I had to fight against as an historian was you know, coming back to Richmond and coming back to Brunswick and coming, you know, I mean, one of the reasons, you know, Janet McCalmer's work on Richmond is so rich is because the records are so rich. And so I found great public local council records for Melbourne, um, good ones for Port Adelaide. So it was very patchy, you know, where, where the local council records um, existed. And the same could be said uh, for the voluntary organisations, though I have to say I think there was a certain sameness to the voluntary organisations' um, responses to the Great Depression. And um, in any general history, alas, you tend not to be able to uh, have finely grained analyses of every every organisation. You have to look to to commonalities as well as obvious differences. Um, you ask what what we don't have. Um, we still don't have a lot of information about um, what you call intelligence, um, and I don't think it's going to come out. Um, uh, I mentioned in passing. And the secret armies that emerged, and they emerged in the 1920s. I mean, then they grow into, into the new army and other organisations in the Depression years. But these old guard and the so-called League of National Security or White Army in Victoria are, are active through the 1920s, and it's very hard to find out precisely who was in them and what they were all doing. And I know that because I'm trying to find out <laughs> this very point at the moment. So um, they're, they're, those records are a bit thin um, or, or difficult to get into, let's say. Um, but with other records, I mean, you're always, as an historian, dependent on what particular government departments to try to preserve. Um, with the Great Depression, you really have to look at state government records because most of the... Um, policy support for the unemployed was carried out at the state level. The federal government left it to the states. And so you get some interesting variation across the states, which I tried to cover in the in the book. I mean, just to add in two points, one is obviously the, the opening up of the repatriation records uh, for the interwar period of, to give you extraordinarily rich material about veterans and their families living through the 20s and 30s. The other is just an anecdote about council records. Um, I was a student at Melbourne Uni in the very early 1980s and John Lack ran a course out in Footscray called okay. History Archives Workshop. And a group of us, he took us to the basement of Footscray City Council and there were all their council records from the 1930s, mm -hmm. just in boxes spread across the floor. Yeah. And our job was to help sort them out and create a finding guide. Uh, and we started going, they were just extraordinary. Every letter that a, a, a an unemployed person in Footscray wrote to the council mm -hmm. and the responses were all there detailing people's experience. It was extraordinarily rich material. Yeah. The Footscray, Footscray records are still pretty good at, at the public record office. Mm. Mm. I'd say Footscray, Preston, Richmond, Brighton, they were the strongest council records I found. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I would have thought Brunswick would be in there. I'm disappointed, John. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've got an interesting question from Georgina, which is um, also asking you to move um, to the Second World War. John. 
In your research for the Second World War, will you be looking at the intergenerational impact of the service of fathers in 1914-18 on the volunteering of their sons in 1939-45 mm. and the psychological and economic consequences for the families unfortunate enough to be the right age for both wars and the Depression? Oh, I would love to, but it's a huge project. Um, can I just say in passing, one of the things I've done some writing fairly, um, I suppose, brave writing in the sense that it ventured into this whole area of personal resilience about three men in the early 90, in 1930s, two of whom suicided and one of whom didn't. And the two who suicided are quite famous. One was Brigadier Pompey Elliott and one was Hugo Throssell, the Victoria Cross winner from Western Australia. And interestingly, both of them lost brothers in World War One. Now, you know, no... I don't know if I've missed it, but I don't think anyone's actually tried to track that. Some Bart Zeno colleague of mine is doing some interesting work about Charles Bean's brother. So, I mean, these men are all out there, you know, fighting, but also losing dearly loved siblings. So that's one issue. Now, the fathers and sons would be absolutely fascinating to do, and we can now do. Um, but, of course... I mean, what you'd have to try and do to 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 follow what I think the question is asking you about what is the impact on well on recruitment is very hard. Often we don't have anything but retrospective oral history about why people volunteered. I mean, nobody really asked them very seriously at the time. And most of the oral history about men who volunteered is done much later. And we were talking about memory, and I mean, Al's the expert on this, that the way in which people remember why they did things in war is filtered through all sorts of, of public and other, um, other discourse. So, I mean, there has been work done on why men volunteered in World War II, but I, I don't find it yet very rich or helpful. And, of course, they've all gone, so we can't ask them even if we did, did filter it through what we know now about memory and oral history. As for the impact on families... It would be well again. We we can't we can't recapture it in any any detailed way. Um, one of the issues I am working on at the moment is revising a book I wrote about the second twenty first battalion that was sent to Ambon in World War Two. Terrible catastrophe. They should never have been sent. And you know, on Ambon, the prisoners of war, eighty percent of them died. And and I'm looking at the memory of that catastrophe and simply to ask, and I, how do I put this? There are a lot of constraints now on that kind of research from ethics committees. And they may be very appropriate restraints, but as soon as you start talking to somebody about was your father so damaged during the war that it, impacted negatively on your childhood you're in 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 deep territory mm. um appropriate and it's appropriate to acknowledge that i mean when i was first not a historian took it out with my tape recorder didn't i and i but now we're so much more conscious about post-traumatic stress syndrome and the impact of that on families that that there are limits to what we may ask and, the, and and what we may explore but to get back to your question i mean the fathers and the sons the fathers from world war one and the sons from world war two we have to rely on what survives and we can interpret that through repatriation records in the case of world war one but not yet in case of world war two so it's a very it's a difficult research task i think to do more than come up with um, I suppose, some, some good hypotheses and um, surmises. What do you think, Al? I, I mean, I'll just add a plug for, for Jim Mitchell's very recent book, Men of War, Men at War, which mm. is about, which is a history of the second, second pioneer battalion uh, based on just extraordinary letters, diaries, interviews and so on. And he, he does explore in quite detail, particularly from the letters, uh, the ways in which First World War family experience impacted or didn't impact on on men who are volunteering uh, in the Second World War. So the, the, you know, there are the beginnings, but it's a, it's a wonderful book. It gives you that sense mm. of that detail of what's going on. So that would just be one thought, yeah. Um, 
another question which leads on from that a little in in that Margaret's asked a question which is probing um, different uh, attitudes to grieving and she said I'm interested in the changing face of grief following the great war as compared to Victorian times um, people told to be stoic and strong for their soldiers told don't grieve for me this denial and silencing of grief carried on and still curtails how we talk or don't talk about death and grief today although I hope it's improving she says do you have any reflections on that well there are scholars particularly I suppose Joy de Moussey who certainly explored this um and yes, there were very, very, I think, clear expectations of how people would respond to the news of the death of a soldier in World War One, particularly uh, a kind of the heroic suppression of, of grief. Um, but um, I argued in in Broken Nation, and again, it is it's a hypothesis. But I think you can only explain the the physical and emotional violence of the conscription referendum as a kind of explosion of grief, um, a, a misdirected aggression. So while the women and the fathers, you know, let's not forget the fathers, many of them were just as devastated by the deaths of their sons. We know this is lots of evidence of that um they were you know meant to present a facade of acceptance of the nobility of their son's death but they probably all were all questioning i mean one of the things that i i quote the letter from one of the raw's sons about the futility of the battle of the song which arrived after the same time as his parents got the news of his death. So they got the news of his death and his brothers died only a few weeks before. And here is this indictment by this son of the of, of the, the command of the war. So what do they do? You know? Um, and I think they probably in most cases suppress their grief, but then it erupts in different forms. And what we now know, I think your questioner was asking about you know, changing attitudes towards grief. What we know is how damaging is that repression of grief and the repression of other trauma. And so when I wrote about Pompey Elliot and uh, Hugo Throssell, um, who, as I said, not only suffered the war themselves, but were wounded and also lost brothers, you know, what we can probably say is their suicides 10 years later are in some senses the product of undiagnosed and untreated grief and, and trauma. And from what I understand of PTSD, if, if the first trauma is not adequately resolved or, or handled, when another trauma comes, the crisis is even greater for the sufferer. So um, we don't, I don't know of much work that's been done about, and it gets back to the earlier question about fathers and sons, you know, about people who are suffering the second loss in World War II. I mean, it's, I guess what I would say in both books, I mean, how do you understand the, the, the endurance of this generation that went through these crises? And... I mean, this is a German example, but one of the people I admire, whose work I admire so profoundly, is Katja Kolwitz. And Katja Kolwitz lost her her son Peter in World War One and her grandson in on the Eastern Front in World War Two, and she, her work is just heartbreaking. And you know, it was just uh, the kind of we asked of this generation things that are almost unimaginable in terms of, of of their emotional grief and trauma, but they live through it, many of them, which to me is the wonder, and not the wonder in the literal sense. How do we, how do we explain it? Endurance, perhaps. Um, Margie, go for another question. You've probably got another five minutes. You write very eloquently about it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I think so. 
Uh, we have a few that we haven't got to. So let's see if we can move through some of these. We've got about five minutes, I think. There's a question from Anna. I'm interested in where uh, the group of Australian nurses who served in World War I uh, were um, and were part of REAC repatriation benefits the great depression etc fit into these narratives where do they serve or how do they fit into the narratives um many well, of them well, served on the western asked front. where they fit into the so she's she's saying yeah. yes hmm. well i mean at the time they probably didn't get a very dominant position in the narrative they've certainly been given a lot of scholarly attention in recent years and as one would expect, it has revealed that many of them suffered profound trauma as a consequence of, of their experience, particularly on the Western Front. So I think um, because they were part of the military institutions, they, they were to some degree uh, incorporated into the narrative of Anzac, but not until recently in a very dominant sense. Um, nurses come to the fore in part through the story of captivity in World War II. So you get, you know, one of the more, more dominant narratives about captivity is the experience of the nurses who were shipwrecked, being brought out of Singapore and um, were interned on Sumatra. Um, but um, I've never found out, Ali, you may be able to answer this, what was their access to repatriation benefits? Yeah, they were, the nurses were eligible for repat benefits, uh, in, including soldier settlement, but actually... They get it, they're much less likely to get it for a range of reasons, including the fact that the medical records for the nurses, ironically, are not as good as they are for soldiers. Um, and I think probably also presumptions of, of need and so on. And also that the whole repat system was all about uh, ensuring that people could, men could become breadwinners again. Exactly. And for, and for nurses, that was a sort of, that didn't quite equate. No, so, so they were meant to marry. They were, technically, they were eligible. But in practice, they got much less than they almost certainly deserved. And in many instances, I think you'd find that the trauma for nurses was psychological. I mean, certainly the ones who are working at the casual clearing stations in, were not necessarily injured themselves, but, but still deeply traumatised by the war. And that was much more difficult to prove and to get sympathetic treatment for. Yeah, yeah. Bronwyn has asked a different question, a bit about POW, so we're bouncing around a little bit here. But um, she's asked if you could expand a little on the POW experiences, their families and differences between the two world wars. Oh, the differences are pretty, pretty profound. I mean, the scale is 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 very different. Um, you know, around four thousand in World War One, um, and relatively low death rate. Um, in World War II, as I've argued for many years, uh, the memory of captivity is one of the dominant memories because, of course, um, a lot of Australians become prisoners, uh, over 22,000 become prisoners of the Japanese, and about a third of them die in captivity, largely of malnutrition and overwork. Um, so, you know, the numbers who die in captivity in the Pacific War are comparable and the stats always vary, but it's comparable numerically to the number who die in combat in the Pacific War. So it's a very dominant story in World War II. And, I mean, people have started, Aaron Peregrine and others have started doing good work on prisoners of war in World War I, but it's, uh, it's, it's a much less prominent part of the history of Australian World War I than it is in World War II. And out of the experience of captivity in World War II, you get many, many um, of the more mythologised narratives, such as Hellfire Pass and um, the Death March at Santa Can. I think we've probably got time just to squeeze in one quick question, and it's uh, it's um, taking us back to the conscription um, debate. And it says, why a referendum on conscription? Why couldn't government simply legislate it? Yes, well, well, although we call it and I call it a referendum, it was actually a plebiscite, but um, it's an important point these days. Hughes's problem was that he, he couldn't guarantee he'd get it through the Senate. Um, and he there was he thought he might have the executive power to just legislate, but uh, just to make it an, an executive order, but he couldn't. He had to change a piece of legislation because the Defence Act, to be boring, the Defence Act of... 1909 said you could you could conscript men but only for home defense so 
first of all, he couldn't persuade the Labour Party itself. As we know, it split. So he had no guarantee that he would get it through uh, through Parliament. And um, so he thought he would go for a popular vote and that would in turn persuade doubters in the Parliament of the need to, to support it. And I think we've managed to get through most of the questions. There are some we haven't, but there are some in there also that um, I think are um, commenting, um, which is great. Um, so, Al, I think probably it being 6.26, I should relinquish this and take back, tag it back to you and just thank both of you for um, a wonderful Q&A session. Thanks, Maggie. Let me, um, let me just share my screen again uh, with a couple of concluding... Uh, whoops, next one. Um, so, yes, thanks so much, Joe, uh, for making the time and, and sharing all of that expertise and the research and so on. Just to let you know, Monash University Publishing generously supports this seminar series, has done for a number of years now. And so uh, you'll, I think, uh, Alicia will talk to you about choosing a book and we all of our speakers get a, a Monash University publishing book. Uh, also, just to let everyone know that our next Making Public Histories webinar is called Behind the Scenes, Making History Exhibitions. And Margie from Old Treasury Building will be talking from Deb Tout smith and Tracy Taylor. And that's on Thursday, the 30th of November, also online by Zoom. And the details are on the History Council website. Uh, let me stop the share and just say once again, Joan, it's been a real pleasure to, um, as you. I said at the start, it's been great to reread the books. Um, I'm writing a history of fathering at the moment, and there's so much in both of those books about families and, and fathering, and uh, yeah, very wonderfully useful, and, and I have to say beautifully written and very engaging books. So hopefully the Depression will now get remembered alongside World War I as being such a profoundly significant event in Australia's 20th mm -hmm. century. Thanks, Joan, and thanks all of you. We had a lot of people came along this evening. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we hope we'll see you at our next uh, seminar in November. And thanks, Margie, for chairing the Q&A and Rowan and Alessia behind the scenes helping us with various technical stuff and with the questions. So thanks, everyone. I'm going to close the, the session now, uh, but thanks so much for joining us and have a lovely evening. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.